Thank you, worship team. Welcome this morning, everyone. It's good to see you. I'm Greg Kowser, one of the pastors here. Uh, and uh, I had a, I'm also a college professor, uh, and I had a week off last week uh, to, uh, for my spring break. Um, and I know that always annoys people who don't get a spring break, but I'm sorry. I got a spring break uh, last, last week. Uh, and uh, I want to say that, that my wife had a very stressful week uh, last week because she had to leave the house every day without giving me a list of things to do. And that was very stressful for her. And I just want to commend her that she did it every day uh, because Rana, Rana has a gift of using my time uh, in, in productive ways. She really does. I mean that. Uh, but she restrained herself from giving me a list of to-do things every day that she walked out the door, except for Friday, which was a simple one. And I actually did do it. Mickey, I told Mickey about that. And Mickey said, and you didn't do it. I said, Mickey, I did it. Right? I did it on Friday, uh, what she asked me to do. But I had a good week. The other thing that it allowed me to uh, kind of marinate in this passage in an extended way, uh, in ways that uh, I don't uh, often get the chance to, um, and I found it to be just a, a very provocative one. I want to uh, kind of apologize and also make you aware of something. Uh, Van made me aware of this today. Uh, I was following a schedule in terms of the passage to cover today uh, that was a little off from what's published in your study booklet. You're thinking we're going to be at the end of chapter 4 today, and I'm actually going to take you in to the first couple verses of chapter 5. Now, that wasn't a sleight of hand. That was just my mistake. I think I had a schedule that was the earlier uh, schedule that we had put together, uh, but I will uh, be traveling over the same kind of things that are talked about at the end of chapter 4, and we will be in the rest of chapter 5, 1 through 12 next week, so we'll still be in that passage, and so uh, I want to encourage you to prepare for that uh, in the coming week. You know, we come to a, a time, and as Van prayed, um, one of the things that we as Christians are called to do by Jesus' command is to look out from ourselves uh, toward our neighbors and our neighbors near and far, not, not just the neighbors in the Ukraine or Russia, right, or uh, as Pastor Steve has done in the Middle East or different things along those ways. We, we do need to, and if we're healthy Christians, we do need to put the binoculars on and look away from ourselves to the needs of other people. And you know how binoculars, they, they, they shut everything else out and they put something that's distant from you and they bring it up close to you so that you can see it. And Pastor Van was doing a little bit of that this morning in his prayer. He was going out and reaching out and making us think about the real human dynamics of what's going on in the Ukraine. It's one thing to just talk about it as war. It's different to think about the kind of dynamics that are happening. We were reading from Zach and Misha, who are our missionaries in the Czech Republic. There's a huge population of Ukrainians. Uh, I think he said something like 30% of the population is from the Ukraine. And so a lot of people in his own ministry and a lot of people that he knows have uh, friends and family that are undergoing all kinds of things. And so uh, in Czech, where he's at, it, it's raw and very close. Well, one of the things is we want to put the binoculars on and look out, but one of the things that often happens at times like this is we can't afford to walk around always with the binoculars on. We actually have to take them off and look at ourselves in the midst of what's happening. And I want to say this because James, of all the things that he does, he's aware of the fact that crises, right, the, the whole book is set in, in a time of crisis. We've got refugees that are on the run. We've got people who've lost their, their some of, have lost family members and friends. They're actually being persecuted by family members and friends. They've lost their homes. They've lost their social fabric. They've lost all these things. They're desperate for jobs. They're trying to survive. And James comes back to them with a message of, wait a minute, you've got to hold on to God's goodness. And, and wait a minute, you can't let these circumstances be an excuse for you being angry, nasty, competitive people. And so when we're in the midst of this moment, one of the things that we don't want to do is use the chaos in the world at large to excuse being angry, nasty husbands at home or to be kids who neglect our responsibilities 
to our parents or to our schoolwork or the people who, because of the chaos that's happening at FAR, all of a sudden we get a pass on thinking deeply. One of the things that happens about in the moment of chaos is that it will reveal your heart. And so one of the things that's important to think about at this moment, right, is things are really in chaos and in many ways we just, we, we just barely come out of COVID and all the stresses that that has called and we still have not seen the full uh, impact of what that will be. Are we okay? Pause for a moment here. Okay, you want to pray? Who, who, who are we praying for? Is Chris? Okay, well, let's pray. Join me and let's pray together for Chris right now. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, just thank you for your mercies. Lord, I pray for our brother Chris. Lord, we love him. Pray for your mercy on his life. Lord, just protect him in this moment. Lord, raise him up. Uh, Lord, we just pray. Lord, watch over him. Uh, love him, Lord, we pray. Uh, comfort, courage, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I will continue to pray for Chris this morning and for Larry and Susan and Cheyenne. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Well, let's come back to our passage here for a moment. Continue to pray for Chris this morning and uh, God's mercies. Well, anyway, as we come to this uh, passage here, one of the things that strikes me about James is he's aware of the fact of what pressure can do. Pressure can turn you into an angry person. Pressure can turn you into a desperate person. And of course, God can recede from your vision. And all of a sudden, you try to figure out how to get yourself out of it, right, in terms. And this is what's happening here. And he's going to deal with something that's kind of uncomfortable. Um, I'm aware, you know, when you come to church, I've had people even say this to me, is I come away from the chaos of my week and I want to come here and I want, I want to feel good. And you should feel good as we celebrate the goodness of God and the promises of God. But one of the things I want to suggest is that God is good to us because he confronts us with ways in which we're walking out of the way of life. And this is an awkward moment, this whole passage. Um, I have not done this ever as a pastor. I don't know if it has ever happened as a pastor in terms of that. But if you think about the awkward situation that is this little part of the letter, where James is speaking to people who are sitting in the congregations who are reading this letter, uh, and he calls them out and pronounces really what is a prophetic judgment on them, right? So here's how the passage begins. I didn't begin my sermon this way. I thought about maybe doing it, but I didn't begin it this way because it's, uh, it's quite an opening, right? So look at chapter 5 and verse 1. Now listen, you rich people, right? The, the idea of now listen is, is it's really like a, it's a command like, come here, come here. Now listen, you rich people, right? Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Right? That, what a great uh, inviting opening that is, right? To a sermon or to a, an address, but the people who are sitting in the congregation, he's not speaking about people outside the congregations that he's addressing. He's speaking to people inside the congregations. How do we know that? Well, if you go back to chapter 2, what is going on in these congregations? Well, these desperate people, right, believers who follow God, what are they doing? They're inviting rich people into their congregations who curse the glorious name of Jesus, it says in chapter 2, and why are they inviting them in? They're trying to suck up to them. They're trying to ingratiate themselves to them so that they can get jobs and protection and security. Now, in the ancient world, nobody would fault them for that. That's exactly what you would do. You would go out and find some powerful people and you would look to become their client so that they would be your patron. So nobody would be surprised by that in the outside world. And then for many of us, just on a human level, we would say, well, okay, they're in desperate situations. They need jobs. They need protection, right? Their families are starving. These are happening. So, okay, let's not be so hard on them. 
right? When James speaks and he condemns the rich who are exploiting the poor and needy, he's not only condemning them, the rich, but he's condemning everyone who's trying to suck up to them. He's condemning the whole congregation for creating the situation. So one of the things I want to encourage you as we're reading this passage, especially when you come to a passage on wealthy people, right? And this is something about us, generally speaking, when we read the Bible. I don't know if you found yourself doing that, but if you're reading a story that Jesus is telling and he's condemning the Pharisees, you always identify with the people who aren't Pharisees, right? You're the good people in the story, right? We always want to identify with the good people in the story. And so we look at the wealthy, and then what do we immediately do? We go up the chain in our thinking to somebody who's more wealthy than we are, right? So we go up the chain and say, oh, they're speaking to them. Oh, they're speaking to so-and-so. Bill Gates, Bill Gates, are you listening, right? Speaking up to him, right? Where's, where's uh, you know, Elon Musk? Where's he at, right? So thinking about that, well, number one, I want you to say he's not speaking to people who don't have some sort of profession who aren't in church. He's speaking to people in church, right? And so the issue here is that he's not only speaking to the people who are exploiting the poor by virtue of their wealth, he's speaking to the people who bought into the system that gives them power. Right? And as we talked about before, by inviting them into the church and elevating them to positions of honor, they're hating the wealthy by encouraging them to trust in their wealth and to think that life is found in the abundance of what they own and to get to them to trust in their riches. So they're hating the wealthy and they're also hating the poor among them by discouraging them from thinking that they truly have riches in Christ Jesus. So hate is happening all over in this congregation. And James is calling it out on the table. And so one of the things, I, I bring this up, right, because sometimes if we're following the Lord, this side of heaven, right, nobody in here has arrived, okay? Some people are close, right? Some haven't arrived. Some people are mature. Some people have grown over time. In certain areas, many of you, you're just walking with the Lord in those areas while you struggle in others. So nobody's arrived. But this side of heaven, Right? It should be full. Sometimes our reading of the scriptures should be confronted with a God who comes over against us in mercy. Right? One of God's mercies is to come and celebrate God's promises. We get to celebrate his security that we have in Christ. But also it's God's mercy to come to us and say, Greg, you're a knucklehead. Greg, you're an idiot. Greg, what are you doing? Greg, you're behaving like a fool. Greg, you're putting on old clothes that don't belong to you anymore. Get them off. Right? And God's mercy, just like a parent with your, with your child, is sometimes walking into them and saying, hey, no, 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 this is not good for you. No, this is not the way you treat your sister. No, no, this is not the way you talk to your teacher. Right? These are inappropriate. And love is demonstrated in confrontation. And this is what James is doing here. So I want to suggest here that church, from time to time, should be an awkward moment. It shouldn't be a place where you just come and feel good about yourself because there's aspects of us that are not good and the Lord loves you too much to let you just enjoy them. So he's going to come after you and say, I love you too much. Wake up, please turn away from this, right? And we're in a place where we're in a system that is pressuring us to go back into it all the time, right? So that's the first thing is we shouldn't be surprised that there's an awkward moment. The second thing here. I want to suggest to you that we all are in the class of the wealthy. Okay, we're all in the class of the wealthy. And let me make some, some points about this first, because I want you to think about yourself. Don't put yourself in the exploited poor. I want to say it in many ways, we all occupy these different classes at certain points in our life. But I want you to think about wealth here in a number of ways. First, Poverty, even in the United States, and here I'm not, I'm not arguing that there aren't some real genuine difficult situations, many of them in fact, in the United States, but if you want to talk about poverty and you use the United States, according to the rest of the world, even the poorest people in the United States are incalculably wealthy. They live a life that people anywhere in the world would not imagine at all. So if you want to put us on, uh, you want to use the world scale, all of us are in the wealthy, right? Number one. Number two, 
James is going to condemn a way of looking at life that all of us are guilty of, and you don't have to have a lot of money to be a greedy person. He's going to talk about the life of greed. He's going to talk about the life that thinks that material possessions or, or treasures, and we're going to talk about this a little bit broader, the treasures as the world values them are the keys to power and success and influence, right, to exalt yourself. And so all of us, right, can be greedy, right? You can be greedy with 10 cents or you can be greedy with $100,000, right? Greed is not something that you need a lot of money to experience it, okay? And then thirdly, he's going to hold implications here for treasures. And here I'm going to, I want to speak to you a little bit more broadly about the idea of what treasures are. Treasures are anything that you have that somebody else wants, that give you uh, uh, an influence or power in that relationship. And we're going to talk about that, right? So you can be wealthy in some sort of resource that other people want. If you have the power to give security to someone by virtue of your position or your size and somebody's in need of protection, you've got something that you can use to leverage power over them. Right? There's all kinds of things that you can do. If you have... Uh, if you're a person who's popular, right, this is a, co- this is a common thing. If you're a person who's popular, uh, somebody who wants that, to be in that group, who wants a little bit of that popularity and wants to be moved out of obscurity, and their association with you will do that, well, that gives you power to exploit them if you want to because you're popular. If you're beautiful and people are attracted to you and you become aware of the power of your beauty, right, of your physique or of your, of, your, of your shape, right, then people will want to absorb it. They'll want to be around it. They'll want a little bit of it. And you can use that to lead them around by their noses. All those kinds of things. If you want power and somebody else is powerful, you want to get next to them so you can get a little bit of that power. And so the idea here of the treasure is having things that the world values, and it can be anything, that the world values that will give you a platform on which you can elevate yourself and your little sphere of influence, whatever it is. And we're going to come back to that in just a moment. So let's read this opening judgment again in verse 1 and talk a little bit about what he's doing with, and I'll help you fill in your blanks as we work our way through. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you, right? Now one thing that, that I, I was listening to is I was listening to Van Pray is, you know, that God is loving and merciful and kind. And that is true, right? We don't often say that God is a God of wrath because that's not inherent in him. That's not his personality. That's not a, an attribute of God. But his wrath is a reflection of his love. It's the expression of his love toward evil. The expression of God's love toward evil is to bring his wrath and justice to bear on it. And one of the things that that we're faced with here in this passage, God is a God of love. Thank God we're getting, we're walking into the, we're in the Lenten season, we're walking up to Easter and and the time of the resurrection and the cross, right, as we're thinking about that, right? Those signal moments, the cross of Jesus Christ, which Christ stepped in to take care of something that we couldn't, to lavish on us all the riches of God. Spiritually, every person in here who knows Jesus is incalculably wealthy, Right? I don't care if you have nothing, right? Materially, you're incalculably wealthy. I don't care if you, have, you don't have any of the levers that the world would say are important power levers, right? You have all the riches of God in Christ Jesus, and you have the Spirit of God living within you. And Christ took care of the thing that was the most threatening thing, God's wrath that was coming toward you because of your sin. He absorbed that into himself, took that on our behalf so that we wouldn't have to have the consequences for our sin, and then he came to life and gave us the life that he won, right? So we have everything in Christ. So as we come, we're coming to celebrate that, right? But at the core of the cross is a God who's holy, who acted in Christ to deal with sin. And sin is something that God has to deal with, and it's something that God doesn't look beyond. And so when we come to this passage right, to even talk about a God who is right now moving, as James does, to bring his justice to bear on somebody is at odds with many of the ways we like to talk about God, right? 
If there is somebody in this congregation who's using a power that they have, their influence, their position, their looks, their money, right, to manipulate and use someone else to elevate themselves or to get something they want by exploiting them, I'm telling you, God's wrath is coming toward you. It's coming toward you. God hates evil. It's coming toward you. I don't, I don't, you know, and, and it's going to come. He's going to measure here. The major focus of James is it's going to come at you at the judgment. Right? It's not going to hold you good stead. Your tarnished gold and your moth-eaten stuffed closets, they're not going to hold you any good before God when you stand at the end because he's going to see that and he's going to bring his judgment on you. Right? And we talk about this. And in this moment, right, people who are using the power that they have, the things the world values to exploit other people, right, are, going to, are, are under God's judgment. Right? Putin and what's happening in Russia is the problem of humanity writ large. It's just a man who has lots of power by virtue of his position, who is motivated by a deep-seated pride, who is exercising his will to extend his power, to leverage it for his exaltation, and, and whoever gets destroyed in it doesn't matter because life is about building my empire. Right? That happens to husbands in homes and, and, and people at work. It happens in little friend groups where you recognize you're the powerful one and you want to leverage your power to be the person who's in charge and get your way and has the people to do that. Right? It's just writ large. He just has a lot of, of influence to wield a lot of power to do a lot of damage. Right? But it's the same sort of thing that we find in every human relationship. So as James begins right, with this startling startling condemnation. And I want you to fill in this little blank here in this first one. Wealth is, here's the difficult word, anything. Wealth is anything that the world values as a currency of exchange. Okay? So this passage is about material wealth, but it's also about the relational dynamics around the possession of anything that the world treasures. So it could be anything that would make you the center of attention or the power broker, right? Something that wealth, because wealth here is the means to something beyond it. And what James is after, he's after adultery. He's after idolatry, right? Just to remind you, right, in Scripture, idolatry, putting some God in the place of God himself. And, of course, for James, as for the whole of Scripture, all the gods, little g, all they are is just covers for self-worship, right? All the other gods, they don't exist. They're, they're human creations. And so every other god is a human being saying no to God and choosing the god of their own creation and the god that they not only have brought into existence, but the god that they've determined what he requires of them. And so Paul sees all of these, for in particular, as elaborate forms of self-worship. Hiding behind all of these other gods are wizards, right, behind the curtain, right, who are pulling the levers. And so what he's going to say ultimately is that any rejection of God is just right back at the heart of the garden. That's what Adam and Eve, right, are you going to submit to God and trust him to tell you who you are, what matters, the boundaries of life in which you're going to flourish and where you're going to find love and blessing? Are you going to trust him to do that? Or are you going to trust yourself? That's the basic. Are you going to trust him? Or are you going to trust yourself? Right? So what's, it, what's going on here is that you've got Christians who've bought into, or people that are sitting in these congregations who've bought into, well, God says, I need to trust in his goodness Look to him in the midst of all these difficulties. Ask him for wisdom. Follow him without reserve, right? Listen to obey his word. That's what I should be doing right now, trusting that he's uh, redeemed me and he's going to bring me to life. He's going to complete his purposes. That's what I should be thinking. Instead, the world says, well, that, that's no way to get out of the difficulties that you're in. What you need to do is you need to figure out how to get the power levers so that you can exalt yourself and protect yourself and get what you want. Right? And so then you look to people in the world. Who are the people that have the power? It's the people who have the money, the people who have the brains, the people who have the beauty. The people, and this is another real interesting one for this moment, the people who have tragedy, the victims, they have a lot of power. 
So we live in this moment, right? Well, I got to figure out, this is why you have so many people trying to sign up for victim groups to find out some sort of way that I get to get a part of that power. How do I get on the fact where my tragedy can be something that I can shut everybody else down because nobody understands my tragedy and also I can get a pass for all of my behavior because you haven't gone through my experience. That's power. Shut up. Don't tell me anything. Right? So we've got, we've got that kind of thing. And so you've got this divide that's happening here. And so James is saying, right, what's happening here is you've got uh, a desire to go the way of the world. And at the end goal of the way of the world is always self-exaltation. It's always you being at the center. It's always you getting what you want. Okay, now, why do I say that? Okay, look back at chapter 3. Look back at chapter 3. Now, James, all the way through James, he's just drawing on something that you find through the Scriptures all the time. Right? There's two ways. Always there's two ways. You can talk about this in the Old Testament or you come to the New. So, in, in the book of Proverbs, right, there's the way of wisdom, the way of foolishness. In the Psalms, way of wisdom, way of foolishness. There's the way of submission to, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbors yourself, or you love yourself with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So there's two ways that are there all the way. And so James breaks this out in two kinds of wisdom, right? Wisdom that comes from above or wisdom that comes from below, right? And I want you to get the, the central aspect of the wisdom from below. It's self-exaltation, self-indulgence, right? So here's what he says. Look at verse 17. Uh, oh, no, back up. Uh, verse 14. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom, quote unquote, does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. This is why in the history of the church, as they've reflected on what's called the seven deadly sins that many of you have heard about, right? The chief of the sins, the head of the pack, if you will, and the reason why it's called the head of the pack is because it's seen to be the ultimate source of all the other sins. And the one that's the head of the pack is the sin of pride. At the core of our rebellion against God, right back in the Garden of Eden, do I trust God or trust myself? Do I elevate Him or do I elevate me, right? In this system of elevating me, God, and this is what happens, right? James talks about it in chapter four, right at the very beginning. God is forgotten, one, or God is somebody that I try to manipulate to get him to do what I want him to do. And so what's happening in the book of James is they're coming into difficulties. When they get into difficulties, they don't ask God for anything because he's not useful, or number two, when they go to him, they ask him with evil motivations, which is, God, I'm coming to you to tell you what you should do to, to do what I want. I want you to, at the end, God, I've got to figure it out. This is how I should get through this difficulty and make me look good, right? This is, you should end this difficulty right now, and this should happen for me, and I should come out with these kinds of things. And God goes, no, no, you need to come and humble yourself before me. So the issue that James is dealing with here is uh, of anything that we can, if we're governed by the wisdom from below, that we'll use to manipulate control and get our own way, right? So uh, this is the kind of idea that James is talking about. So none of us can escape this because all of us in our relationships have power levers, right? trying to think of the ones I want to use and not use, right? Um, if you have money and other people need it, you've got power. If you are the, uh, in a marriage, right, if your, uh, uh, the wife has tremendous power in the sexual arena, if you're in uh, a marriage, the husband, 
right, can withhold his approval, his affirmation, his presence to punish. Right, if you're at a job, you can hold over people's heads. If you have some authority, you can hold over people's heads, their promotion, their direction upward, right? They're flourishing there, right? If you're at school, you have the power, often via social media, if you've got a following, you could use your following to slander, destroy, and undermine somebody, to ostracize them, to cut them out of the group, all kinds of things that we have. We have wealth that people want. I want their popularity. I want a little bit of, of that, that. I want to have the position that they have. I want to be someone who's more important than I am. I want people to take my ideas seriously. I want them to value me. Why is it that I post and nobody clicks on mine until I put somebody else in my post, like my grandsons? Right? Why am I not just valuable on my own? All those kind of things. It afflicts us in the, in, the, in the very simplest way where we want to. Children, adult children, will use the grandchildren to manipulate the grandparents. Right? Now, I'm not speaking of anybody in my family, just to make sure that's clear. Okay, I just want to make sure that's clear. But that's one of the things we can do. We can use it to manipulate the other person. And so you have a wealth, you have something that somebody values, and when the wisdom from below is at work, you're going to use it to exalt yourself and get your way, right? You withhold affection if it gets you what, what you want. You withhold praise if it gets you what it want, right? If you're a bitter uh, dad, you withhold praise and affirmation from your kids because you want to pass, piss on that, uh, pass on that bitterness to them. You never got affirmation and daggone it, they're not getting it either, Right? So all those kind of things here, when James is here, I, I don't want us to expect that we get beyond it. Now, let me say this one thing that I think that has, has grabbed me here before I get into the, the self and the, the charge, the warning itself. In the world, the winner is the one that has everyone bowing at their feet. Right? In the world, the winner is the one who has everyone bowing at their feet. In the kingdom, the winner is the one leading others to bow at Christ's feet along with them. Right? In the kingdom, the winner is the one leading others to bow at Christ's feet along with them. Okay, let's come to verses 2 and 3. The, the charge behind the warning, right? Here he gets, James doesn't pull any punches. Your wealth is rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. Uh, you have hoarded wealth in the last days. Okay, uh, very encouraging verses there, just so uh, we get that out there. James is, is trying to encourage us, so he's giving warm metaphors, right? of the things here, tarnished gold, moth-eaten garments, uh, as he comes at that. Now, if you're looking at your notes here, what he wants to say is the tarnish on the gold and silver is demonstration, your little line over, that they're greedy hoarders. They're greedy hoarders of their riches. They've got gold and tarnish, and so, so there's, they're not generous, they're not, they're not investing the money, they're, they're hoarding it for themselves, and so it just tarnishes as it sits there for lack of use and no generosity that's att attached to it. And they're stuffed closets. They can't wear it all. And over time, what happens, right, the moths eat it. And so their, their stuffed closets with moth-eaten clothes and their tarnished gold and silver are testifying to the fact that they're just greedy hoarders. They have way more uh, than they need, and they're heaping it up for their own benefit. And then he kind of switches the metaphor a little bit, and he says that the tarnish, the actual tarnish on the gold and silver, symbolizes the corrosion spreading in your heart, right? Is that this tarnish is like this poison that's spreading in your heart. So you've substituted the gift for the giver, and you're pursuing a life centered around your own selfish ambition, 
So the tarnish on the gold and silver, so the greed, right? So greed, the, the tarnish points to their greedy hoarding, and the greed points to the fact that they're adulterers, they're idolaters, okay? That they have a vision of life that has themselves at the center. So they don't have a kingdom vision for their wealth, right? A, a life that loves other people, that loves God, that wants to use their resources to benefit other people, it's dead. They follow down the path of death. Now, I want you to think about in terms of wealth, in terms of how God wants us to think about it as kingdom citizens. Okay? And again, I'm still using the idea of wealth as any kind of treasure that you have that it gives you a leverage of power. You know, if you're, if, uh, one of the things that happens at Cedarville often, if you're, if you're in any kind of, of vocational calling or career where you're dealing with vulnerable people, traditionally, there has been a high ethical threshold that should be true of those kinds of people. So if you're going into allied health or any kind of health-related field, right, you walk into a room as a nurse and you've got somebody completely unclothed who is under anesthesia that you are responsible for. If you're in the psychology field or the counseling field, you're walking in, usually the people that are coming to you are in crisis. If you're in the schools, then you're dealing with impressionable children right, who are forming their very own identity, and you're, trying, you're there both to, to uh, exemplify it and to encourage them into healthy development, right? But you've got a very uh, shapeable, moldable, malleable audience that you can just basically tell them whatever they want, uh, whatever you want, and if you're enthusiastic about it, they'll just cheer it. So it used to be that there's a high threshold for ethical behavior in that. If you're in the health field, a high threshold. If you're in any kind of field where you're dealing with vulnerable people, you have a power by virtue of what you come to bring to them in their desperation that can be easily exploited. So you have pastors who've exploited women in their congregations. You have psychologists who've taken advantage. You have doctors who've done that. You have all those kinds. Because when our evil desires are at work, we will leverage the power we have to exploit other people, to elevate ourselves. And James is saying that tarnish on your gold and silver is indicative of the tarnish on your souls. And it's a picture of the darkness that's spreading, the death that's happening to them in the kingdom, right? In the kingdom, wealth is a gift from God meant to be acquired and stewarded according to kingdom values, right? James wants to say, remember back in chapter one, one of the core benefits of following Jesus is he gives you a right perspective on your wealth, right? In chapter one, he said, the wealthy, you should, res you should exalt in your humiliation. <laughs> you wealthy people, you should exalt in your humiliation because God is freeing you from thinking that this is the key to life that the wealth that you have is the key to life. He's freeing you from that to have a life that's truly anchored to what's true. You should exult in that. The people who are poor, you should exult in your exaltation, that you have all the riches of God in Christ. And so one of the benefits of the wealthy, of following God, is having their perspective toward wealth righted by God's mercy. And for a kingdom citizen, think about this. Our thoughts, our capacities... Our strength, our experiences, our resources, and everything he allows us to possess or acquire are all gifts from him and are be submitted to him without reserve. They're all gifts from him. Your capacities, your, your, have you ever thought about stewarding your experiences? God says here, right, in his providential ordering, he allows things to come into our lives. Right? He God's not asleep and all of a sudden he wakes up one day, <gasps> look what's going on in Tracy's life. I missed that. No, he knows everything that's going on. He knows her past, he knows her present, he knows her future. And God says, I have the resources in Christ to reclaim what the locusts have eaten. I have the resources in Christ to bring life, even when other people intended evil. Right? As Kristen and Levi reminded us in their prayer last time, right? Joseph sat there and said, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. And look what he's done out of the mess that you've made. 
And have you ever thought about stewarding experiences, especially if you have an experience of tragedy in the past, when your evil desires are at work, you will leverage your experience to shut other people up. You don't understand the tragedy that I've had. You don't understand the things that are going on. And you shut yourself off from the wisdom of the people of God because they don't understand and they're outside. And then you give yourself a pass by virtue of the fact that you don't understand the tragedy I've had, so shut up and don't tell me anything. And what James is saying here, if you believe in God's goodness, well, you're going to turn to him for wisdom, and you're going to steward your experience like Joni Erickson Tata, and from your wheelchair, you're going to proclaim the sufficiency of God and point people to him. You're going to talk about the riches you have in Christ to help other people who are struggling with the lack of material resources to say, no, 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 you don't get a pass, even if you're being exploited by other people from following Jesus. Right? He's going to, a person who has a grip on the riches they have in Christ is going to come to a husband and say, you don't have a pass for committing yourself fully to your wife and loving her like Jesus just because she's not giving you what you should have as a husband. So stop using your power to punish her, to withdraw from her, to do those things, right? Because you have riches in Christ and so the issue here is any of your services, any of your experiences, any of your resources, any of your talents, any of your capacities, they all belong to him and they're all gifts from him, right? So this morning, I was riding in a truck on the way here, crazy things that happened to me on the truck on the way here, but I was just thinking about this morning as I was walking, I was driving here, not walking, driving here, I was thanking God for the ability to appreciate what I could see, that I could see today. I thanked him for the ability to be able to think clearly. At least I think I'm thinking clearly, right? I, I, ask, I thank God for the ability to walk and to get here where I'm going today. I thank God for all those types of things because he's sustaining all those things at his behest, right? In him, we live and move and have our very existence today. So I'll get them from him, and so I want him to give me wisdom to steward them. So his kingdom, right? Remember this Jesus in Matthew 6? His kingdom is what we seek first. All the rest of life, our standing, our influence, our physical condition, our possessions are added by God as he sees fit. At the end of the day, I want to say, God, have I been faithful? I'll trust you for the reach of my life. I'll trust you for the, my standing in this community. I'll trust you for those things. Now, if you want to look at a portrait of kingdom values, then you look at the wisdom from below. Come to chapter 3 with me for a moment. If you've got somebody, right, who's not motivated by pride or self-exaltation, well, what kind of things do you find when they go through difficulties? So what, what kind of things do they do? Well, here he says, wisdom that comes from heaven is first pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow a peace uh, uh, peace reap a harvest of righteousness. So not, not for you to write down, but I, I just wrote to myself all these different. People who are given by kingdom values are going to leverage their power to bring harmony between people who disagree. Instead of relationships where the worth and inner life of another person is devalued, they want to promote relationships where every person is treated equally. They want relationships where each considers the impact of their life on the others. That's called being considerate. God's kingdom citizens will be glad to share their resources to help somebody in time of need. That's mercy. They will gladly harness their wealth to promote good things. They'll use wealth. They won't use wealth to exalt themselves. Rather, they will submit it to God to be enjoyed and shared in a manner consistent with his intentions. You remember Jesus talking about this in the Sermon on the Mount? Remember one of the things he encouraged people to do? Don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. What do you think he was concerned about, right? Using the treasure to exalt myself. One of the illustrations he uses in the Gospels, and this is rooted in the first century culture, when you came to the temple to give your temple tithe and your gifts, you dumped it in something that was sort of like a metal trumpet, right? And so if you were, you know, uh, uh, Scrooge McDuck, right, and you showed up at the temple, 
and you dumped your whole bag of silver and gold in there, I mean, it sounded like you just had won the jackpot, you know, at a, at a uh, slot machine in Vegas, right? <laughs> going down. Man, what an impression that would make. Did you hear that? And then here comes, right, the little widow. Tink, to tink, tink, tink. And Jesus knows that we will, right? James makes it clear the only one that will constrain you from trying to exalt yourself in every relationship you have is the Spirit of God transforming you from the heart. Unrestrained, you will elevate yourself. You want your way. You want your way in every way and in every place. You'll judge other people, as James said, by virtue of whether or not they're doing what you want them to do. And you'll become the law and the lawgiver and displace God. So the issue here, now finally, the evidence supporting the charges, okay? And he uses, uh, James doesn't stop here. He says in verse 4, look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the Lord, ears of the Lord Almighty. This is the Lord of hosts. And have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was, who was not opposing you. Now there's a quote here under verse 4 and 5. And I want you to fill this in if you would. It says, hearts gripped by the wisdom from below will take their wealth. They'll take their wealth and leverage it to elevate themselves. They will do whatever it takes to get on the top of their little social pyramid. So they'll take their wealth to elevate themselves and they'll do whatever they can to get on the top of their social pyramid and to stay on top. You remember what James said at the beginning of chapter four? Where do all the battles and fights come among you? It comes from your arrogance and pride. Right? When you think about a home, a husband and wife in a home, how many of the myriad of decisions that you make every day are thus saith the Lord decisions? I don't know what it would be percentage-wise, you know, 0.2% of them. Right? Thus saith the Lord, thou shalt keep the house clean on Thursdays. Thus saith the Lord, thou shalt not leave sinks, you know, dishes in the sink. Thus saith the Lord, you shall put your dishes away in the dishwasher. Thus saith the Lord, you shall not have a dishwasher because that's wasteful. Uh, thus saith the Lord, right, uh, you should make your bed every time you get out of it. Right? Thus saith the Lord, you should have a house that looks pristine when you walk in so that anytime somebody comes in, you should. Thus saith the Lord, thou shalt clean your house before any guests arrive. Right? Thus saith the Lord, you know, we shall not eat, right? we shall not drink coffee. I'll leave that one uh, unsaid. Thus saith the Lord, right, that's evil. Right. Thus saith the Lord, you shouldn't spend money on coffee. Thus saith the Lord. Right, you go, but when we, we I, I joke about that, but that's the way we operate with each other. Right? You walk into a building and say, anybody who has their right mind shouldn't dress like that. Anybody who's in their right mind shouldn't talk like that. Anybody who's, and all of a sudden, we're, we're the law keepers, and we don't even pause to recognize that everything that we just said has no definite command from the Lord, and we're setting ourselves up to the standards to judge all the other people. And, and so we get mad at other people. We don't even investigate. I'm, I'm upset with them because they've done that. And nobody just pops in and says, wait a minute, do you have a legitimate expectation? Is there something that is redemptive about your expectation? Is there something that's rooted in something that God really wants for that person? Or are you just upset that they don't like your way? I mean, how many things are like that? Friendships, neighbors, how could you be somebody and not Thus saith the Lord, thou shalt not have dandelions in your yard. What is wrong with that person, that evil person next door? They are blowing there. You know, every time I see one of their dandelions, you know, come to seed over there and they just waft over me, I just, you know, I want to go torch that yard next door, right? Maybe I'll wait till they go on vacation and go fix it for them, right? So all of those things are thus saith the Lord in terms of our minds, but really they're thus saith me. Thus saith me, and I'm not talking about the fact that it's, there's not, it's wrong to have ways that you want to do your life. It's not wrong uh, to have ways that you want to do your home. Right? 
But at the same time, you need to recognize that those are things that are not, thus saith the Lord. They're not. You're not God. And you don't have the right to judge people over those. And so as you come together, you need to come together and recognize these aren't thus saith the Lord things. And we need to negotiate these and compromise and talk about these things. Talk about the values that are behind these behaviors and see if they're really after what God's after. Thus saith the Lord, thou shalt send your kids to Christian school. Thus saith the Lord, thou shalt go to public school. Thus saith the Lord, thou shalt homeschool. All those kinds of things are really pride that I'm asking. Now, there's wisdom behind each one of them. There's wisdom behind them for different people. But we become those kinds of people because we want to exalt. I want my way to be heard. Right? As we've had it here, we've had people split from the church over ephemeral issues. So that's the kind of thing here that James is talking about. You get a wealth, right? And some people will use my influence, my power, my money to do that. And what James wants to say here is this is something that offends God, right? Is that we're heaping up power to exalt ourselves. And this is something that we shouldn't be doing, especially in the last days, right? Now, do you think about What James is talking about here, we're in the last era before the next thing that's happening on God's time scale is his return. And kingdom citizens recognize that the king came, he died, he raised from the grave, he's ascended to heaven, he's given us the spirit, and he's coming. And there's going to be a day of reckoning to come for those who rejected the king and those who follow the king. And so kingdom citizens are living with an anticipation of the kingdom coming. And so they recognize that nothing in this life ultimately will satisfy you. That'll only be met when he comes. And what I want to do is I want to use all of my resources to honor the king and to invest it for his services. I want to promote his causes in the lives of the people around me. I want to promote his causes around the world. I want to promote his causes in my own life. And I want to spend my money and my influence to help people with me, by God's grace, bow at the knees of Jesus so we're ready for the king to come. Everything. So if you have leverage in a small child's life because for some reason they look up to you, if you're a kingdom citizen, you're going to get on your knees and pray and ask God to let you lose, use that influence to commend Jesus by everything you do and say. If you have resources before God, you're not in, in thinking about how you're going to invest that money primarily to pad your own home. You're going to be thinking, God, how can we maximize this money to further your kingdom purposes? So let me fill in these blanks here at the end. All right, and I'll, I'll come down and have grace and come, but I want to get out these uh, principles at the end of this passage. A, here, pride is the driving force in the wisdom from below. Pride is the driving force in the wisdom from below. Our evil desires spring from a desire for self-exaltation. Pride is the driving force. C.S. Lewis is famous for his little uh, phrase that that pride is the anti-God state of mind. So pride is the force in the wisdom from below and our desires spring from a desire for self-exaltation. B, the only way someone can dethrone themselves is by a work of God in their hearts. All right, if you want to put down a passage here, put down James chapter 1, verses 16 to 18. James 1, 16 to 18. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be the kind of first fruits of his creation. Now, I just want to say it, you know, for us as followers of Jesus, We're still people who are on the way, right? We've talked about this. Yes, you have been saved, but you've not been fully conformed to the image of Christ. Yes, you have become a son or daughter of God, but you've not been fully brought into your birthright yet. You have been resurrected, but not fully yet. And because we're already not yet people, I still have evil desires that I have to contend with. 
I don't really have to convince many people of that. You still have evil desires. You, you still have that desire to elevate yourself, to tell God no and to go your own way. It's still there. James's answer for that is, again, back in chapter 1, verses 19 to 25, what do we do? We continually go to listen to God's wisdom and obey it. Right? So I know uh, one of the things that Will does in his class and different things that, that we all need, right? He's often asking, well, who did you talk to this week who has some wisdom? And that's a question for us all. Who is your wisdom? Your peers? Tons of wisdom out there on TikTok. Social media? Right? Where, where is your wisdom? Right? So... God is the source of wisdom to tell me who I am, who he is, what matters today in the face of that, okay? Number three, what the world treasures can be a snare to the believer. What the world treasures can be a snare to the believer. You can get caught up in it. I, I confess, one of the things that is like a, a little sidelight of Ron and I, we like to watch these fixer-upper shows, Right, watch the fixture upper shows. And one of the things you have to watch about yourself is coming to envision the good life as the next thing that you've seen that you think is really cool on the inside of your house. Oh, we need that. Oh, we should have that. Oh, why don't we try to do that, right? Now, there's one thing that's a project to do and all those kind of things like that to think about in good stewardship. But all the time, it's, it's selling a way of looking at life and seeing yourself that thinks that if I just had that, if we just could fix that up, if I could get that kind of house, I could live in those kind of places, well, then I'd really have it. And it, 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 you put binoculars on, you forget, wait a minute, you have Jesus. You have everything. You need to consult him first before you move out and buy into this, right? Fourthly, okay, or, or uh, E, A, B, C, D, I'm sorry, D. Any worldly treasure and the power it yields must be acquired, acquired and or stewarded according to kingdom values, This is true of material possessions as well as any sort of quality, skill, social status, or experience that conveys authority and influence in the eyes of the world. That conveys authority and influence in the eyes of the world. For every young girl who becomes aware or every woman who becomes aware of her attractiveness to men, she has a power to wield for their blessing or their cursing. For every man who becomes aware of the vulnerable women in his life who are lacking something either from home or from whatever, he offers them security and affirmation, which is the core of male immodesty, to exploit them. So whatever you have that offers authority and influence in the eyes of the world. E, believers will be held, this is believers will be held accountable by God for the way they acquire and steward their treasure. You know, let me, let me talk about this treasure. When you're in a family, kids can become aware of the fact that the parents want their affirmation, right? You, you can tell kids, you know, the old phrase, this hurts me worse than it does you, and they're gone, you don't understand, you, you, yeah, right, right? But, but when, you're, when you're in a moment and you're, and you're disciplining someone and there's, there's distance between you or the, or the child is drawing away from you as a teenager or whatever, it is crushing your heart. And an evil, right, an evil temptation will come in for that child to use the leverage that they have on the parent's heart to manipulate them. I got a power, right? So I know that if I go to school and I behave in a certain way, my parents are so worried about their reputation, they'll bend over backwards, right, to, to cover it up. I just got them right with a nose ring, right, to do whatever they want. And so then all of a sudden you become aware or you see it, you see it maximized in, in a divorced family, 
So you got the dad over here who becomes the treat dad. You got the mom over here on the other side. You got the child in between who's got all the levers of power. Right? I'll withhold my affection or I'll go with this person. Well, maybe I'll come live with you. Maybe I won't come. And again, you can't fault the child in terms of the middle of, of the mess that they've made. But the, the natural inclinations of our heart will to be used any kind of power we have to leverage it to exalt ourselves. Right? We'll use tragedy to elevate ourselves. So anything that we have. Then uh, next here, uh, living by kingdom values will not make sense to the world. Living by kingdom values will not make sense to the world. If you're the popular kid and you don't use your popularity to build your own brand and to lift yourself up and to stay with all the beautiful people and you value all the people, that doesn't make sense to people in the world. When you give away your resources for the benefit of somebody else, that doesn't make sense to them, especially when you do it in private, right? Because we can even, in our, in our, our perverted uh, world in which we live, people can help the needy or the people that are in difficult because they want to be seen as people who help the needy. They want to be seen and they want to be a part of the people who are the helpers of the needy. And all of a sudden, we, call, we have a new term for it. We call it virtue signaling. We want a virtue signal. We can do that in the Christian arena too. Talk about the people we're helping. Right? We're trying to elevate ourselves in terms of that. So those are the things that, that we can do. And then finally, kingdom living, a life submitted to God's rule and live to God's glory is not undertaken to succeed in the eyes of the world. The wealth, reach, and status of the believer's life is left up, left up to God to determine. There's so many things here that, that when I think about, you know, when you get into difficulty... In a marriage, you will have a ton of people who will come along and say, you don't deserve this. And it may be true. There may be some things that are really, really dysfunctional that shouldn't be happening. But the real question of a kingdom follower is what does Christ deserve? What does Christ deserve for me in this marriage? What has he enabled me to do and to be? And for somebody who forgives somebody who has sinned, that doesn't make sense to the world because you should get justice. For somebody who doesn't use the power that you now have because of the other person's failure, no, you're giving up your, you're giving up your power card. No, you get, this is why Scripture says, what's one of the characteristics of biblical love? Love does not keep a record of wrongs. Why? What's the record for? The record so that any time that you want or you feel threatened or you want to have something from the other person, you just reach back in your bag and you pull it out and you say, you remember when you did that? Shut up. You know what you did? Shut up. You know what? Shut up. Right? We want people to feel perpetually guilty so that we can use their guilt to manipulate them. That's what the evil from below will do. We'll do it in marriages. We'll do it in relationships. We'll do it in workplaces. Right? Only God can come in and bring a breeze of change, right? Now, I know this is a hard thing, right? This is a hard thing, but I would really encourage you, Grayson, would you come up as you guys sing? I would really encourage you this week to pay attention to your relationships. Where are you leveraging the power that you have to control and manipulate the people in your life? Where are you holding them up to standards that all of a sudden you're the lawgiver? Where are you using the leverage that you have to invite people to bow at the knee of King Jesus? Right? As we do that. Grayson, would you sing us?